And we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at Lions Hall, Canisius College, Buffalo, New York. It is the 5th, or the 5th, the 6th of May, 2008, approximately 10.20 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Leonard Amborski. I was born August 23rd, 1921, in Buffalo, New York. Okay, what was your educational background prior to the beginning of World War II? I went to uh, public school number 11 on Doton Poplar, and I went to uh, East High School. And after East High School, I went to Canisius College and uh, graduated there in 1943. Okay. Do you remember where you were and um, what you heard about, how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was at my date's house on a Sunday afternoon. We had the radio on and we got the message then mm -hmm. at the Pearl Harbor Day. Mm -hmm. how, what were your feelings when you heard this? I never heard about Pearl Harbor until then, didn't know where it was. Right, most people didn't. But it didn't take long to find out what happened and so on. So uh, for further comments on the radio fill us in on the details. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, you were, where were you working at the time when the war started? I was still a uh, student at Canisius College. Oh yes, 42, mm -hmm. okay. You said 43. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, what did you do after you graduated from Canisius? I graduated in March uh, 1943 and it, I started teaching the Army Air Corps cadets who were stationed at the college and they just started the program, the college training detachment at that time. And uh, so I taught them physics and I also taught the civilian classes in the physics of Canisius starting in May 1943. Uh, the uh, Air Corps students uh, had just arrived that month. There were 200 of them in the original group. I, they were taking a five-month course and uh, four day, four months were in classwork and one year, one month they spent in the learning how to fly. Mm -hmm. Now the course you were teaching, was was that supposed to be an accelerated course? Would it be nor longer than the normal course that would be taught? You mean to the Air Corps students? Yeah. No, it was an abbreviated course. We taught them pertinent physics subjects that might be important for them to know as flyers in, in, in combat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have to design this course, or did the Defense Department give it to you? No, I, we designed the course. We selected the parts that we thought were important for them to know. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that you, you taught, for example? Well, we tried to teach them some of the mechanics of airplanes, why they fly, the Bernoulli principle, mm -hmm. what kept the plane up in the air, and we taught them things on uh, computer, a little bit of computing distances and time, and so they would know some idea on in, in, from instrumentation. So we taught them things like electricity, a uh, little bit of meteor, meteorology too. Okay. Um, now, after, in 1944, you, you worked with the uh, Carnegie Institute? Yeah, so in um, May 1944, they were ending the college training detachment program for the Army Air Corps. At that time, they had a need for scientists at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, which is Carnegie Institute in Washington. And there were eight of us on the faculty who at that time went to Washington, D.C. to uh, work at the Carnegie Institute. The, uh, we were assigned to various activities. I was doing work on the magnetism, studying the magnetic uh, effects of the Earth. also worked on magnetic compasses. Uh, compasses for the Air Force and compasses for the uh, Navy and Coast Guard. Of those eight people, many of them were sent overseas because we were, uh, we were compiling data on the ionosphere, which is related to radio transmission. So people were sent as far as Baffin Bay, Alaska, Christmas Island, mm -hmm. Trinidad, and uh, they were at these stations where we were compiling magnetic data as well as ionospheric data. But fortunately, I happen to be staying in Washington, mm -hmm. where I worked on the, on the compass work and also on detecting and deactivating mines. Uh, we were anticipating invasion of Japan at that time. Mm -hmm. So they brought in a lot of Japanese mines, and we were 
doing research on how to deactivate these particular mines to protect our troops if they were, if they were going to invade Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, um, could you go into detail on some of the things you did while you were there? A little more detail? Or? Well, we, we designed compasses specifically. The, one of the most detailed one was, I think, for Air Corps. Uh, these compasses were designed to make sure our pilots would get to their destination and get back. And uh, we also were designing compasses for the Coast Guard. I remember getting actually on a Coast Guard ship uh, in Glen Burnie and, and, and uh, near Baltimore where we were testing these compasses. And then how, when the how were they different than previous compasses? Yeah, they were more automatic. They were automated and they would be recording the data as you went along. Rather than just looking at a compass, they would have a recording devices. Kind of computerized then? Yeah, I mean, with early stages of computerizing, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, <clears throat> what was your work day or work week like? Well, I think we worked five and a half days then. We worked Monday through Friday and half a day on Saturday. It was uh, in a beautiful setting in Rock Creek Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, the buildings I worked in uh, primarily were non-magnetic buildings because we didn't want the outside influence of the building having any steel mater or magnetic material. So the building that we worked in was a rather unique building in that it was all wood and they used copper nails to put it together. Mm -hmm. So we did, we did studied uh, compass deviations and, uh, and uh, how they might be affected by the outside influences. So the job you were doing was probably highly classified and you had a high security clearance? And yes. And all of that? The, we were, we were um, <coughs> essentially qualified by the War Manpower Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they looked at our credentials in terms of training and knowledge and experience. So they gave us well, a, an exemption from being military people. Mm -hmm. At one time they considered putting us into the military, but they said, well, there's, what's the point in doing it? We're doing the same work anyhow. So the War Manpower Commission kept us as civilians. Were you briefed on who you could talk to and who you couldn't uh, as far as no, you know, we, what you were doing? No we, did, no, we were not allowed to discuss the nature of our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, um, now, when you lived in Washington, where did, where did you live? Uh, did they provide housing or? No, I lived, uh, uh, I lived in, I worked in Rock Creek Park, which was northwest Washington, but mm -hmm. I lived right across the street from the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, I got married when I was there, mm -hmm. and uh, we lived in an apartment directly across the street. If you were in our bathroom on, on the pot, you could look out the window and see the dome of the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a car at that time? No, we didn't have a car. We used public transportation. For a dollar and a quarter, we had a pass. You could go anywhere in the city mm -hmm. at that time on a trolley or bus. Mm -hmm. I also taught night school there. I taught chemistry in one of the public night schools, Theodore Roosevelt High School. So I lived near that other town, but we had a lot of exciting days because we lived right across from the Capitol. And any dignitaries coming in, we would get a chance to see them. Mm -hmm. One of the most notable things I remember is seeing President Roosevelt the day he left the White House to go to White Springs, Georgia, before he died, he was in an open car with his fedora, mm -hmm. and I took a picture of him at that time, so I still, that was the last I saw oh. President Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. how, how did you feel when you heard about his death, especially seeing him just well, before he left? To, of course, to me, he was a, a hero, I think, mm -hmm. because everything I knew about him, so I felt very badly about that, yeah. We also enjoyed the parades they had when Eisenhower came to Washington and General Wainwright, uh, there was great celebration. Mm -hmm. We lived in Southeast. We also had a daughter born that year. And uh, when the war ended, in uh, the VE war, uh, no, the Japanese war, in August 1945, we, I, my wife and I were pushing the baby carriage down Pennsylvania Avenue, rejoicing with everybody else. Mm -hmm. My three, one, two month old daughter was sound asleep in a carriage. And everything. <laughs> now, with you being in physics, uh, with the dropping the atomic bombs, were you even aware that there was research like that going on? No, we knew nothing about it. Mm -hmm. no. how, how, what did you think when you heard about these 
weapons? Well, when it happened, uh, of course, having been alerted to the possibility we might have to invade Japan and knowing what we might, the consequences of our people being killed, I was very happy to see that mm -hmm. we saved a lot of our own lives. Mm -hmm. Probably tens of thousands of American lives were saved as a result, so I was happy to see that. Mm -hmm. Now, living in Washington during the war, um, especially at night, did you have the, the blackout curtains and, and all of that? And no, not really. No, we never did any, but I don't recall any blackout at all. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, were your food items rationed at all? Oh, definitely, yeah. My wife used to go to the, the, to the local store and he'd give her a package. We didn't know what it was. It came home was probably hamburger or something like that. So you never knew what you got. Uh, mystery meat. Butter and, <laughs> and meat were very scarce. They're hard to come by. I noticed you said a staple was spam. Oh yeah, we had a lot of spam. Yeah. Do you still eat it today? Or? No, no, I don't like it. Anymore. <laughs> um, what What did you do for entertainment? Well. I guess uh, my wife was pregnant, so we did a lot of walking and we did a lot of sightseeing. We got to see many things in Washington, Glen Echo Park, we went to the Franciscan Monastery. Uh, so we got around the town to, to see what was there. So we got the, of course, the Lincoln Memorial. We walked around the uh, Tidal Basin. We always enjoyed the cherry blossoms there. So we did a lot of sightseeing around the town. That was our major effort of, uh, I don't think we even went to movies in those days. We just did mm -hmm. sightseeing. Mm -hmm. Did you get to meet any dignitaries at all? Well, on the way to work one day, I met, coming out of the apartment building on Connecticut Avenue, President Truman. The day he took over his office, mm -hmm. he lived in an apartment. I saw him come out of his office, out of his building that morning, when mm -hmm. after Roosevelt died. I also remember seeing Ch General Charles de Gaulle. Oh. He was on the street one day when I was there too. So those are the two dignitaries, other than the Eisenhower and Wainwright, whom I saw on parades. Mm -hmm. But I got pretty close to the President Truman at the time in De Gaulle. Now, you had a brother that served in the Merchant Marines. You want to mention him? Yeah, my brother and I, we started school together in Cleveland. We went every class together through freshman year at Canisius College. Now, how old was he? He was uh, 11 months older than I was, so we were almost like twins, so we all went to school together. So he spent one year at Canisius, then he went into the Coast Guard, and you know, ultimately went to the Merchant Marine Academy on Long Island. Part of their training was to be on a merchant vessel, mm -hmm. and uh, he was assigned to a merchant vessel, which went to England on the way back. They were torpedoed, and that's where he lost his life. Mm -hmm. So I spent four years researching this in recent years and published a book about yeah, but what you donated to our museum, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you. Um, how, how did your family feel, especially you, as being so close to him? Oh, that was the most tragic event in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I still recall my mother when she screamed when she got the message. Uh, all we learned at that time was that he was missing in action. It wasn't until about three months later my mother got a letter from the mother of one of the survivors of the ship to, giving us the details of how it happened. So it was really... Uh, and my mother was in a very bad state of mind for a long time after that, so it did affect the family very strongly. Was your father living at that time? Yes, he was. Yeah, he was living, and he kept writing letters trying to find out more information. And those letters I still have copies of, and uh, of course it was a real tragic event for the whole family. Sure. Now you said you had a very close cousin that also died in the war. I had a cousin, Art Amborski, Arthur Amborski, who whose mother and my mother were sisters, and our fathers were brothers. They were married in a double wedding. So he was like a brother to me. He went to Burgard High School. He was a four-star four athlete. He was all high in football and basketball. He was class president. He was an honor student. He had an offer to play professional baseball with the Cleveland Indians. But when he graduated in 1943, he, he got in the Air Force joined the Air Force, and uh, ultimately he wound up in Italy, and he was a uh, gunner, I guess, on the, on the plane, and they were shot down over Vienna, Austria, and he was killed. Mm -hmm. right. He was buried in a cemetery right near Austria, and then four or five years later they uh, exhumed his body, and he's now buried in Ardennes in Belgium. 
So I, and I basically lost two brothers in the war. Mm -hmm. Now, just to change the topic a little bit, you said that uh, you surprised some of your cadets one night. Um, oh, yeah. I'm here. Moonlighting? <laughs> yeah, I was moonlighting at a, at a local tavern, and they had attended a dance down the street at Memorial, Memorial Hospital, which is now ECMC. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, I was behind the bar, and all of a sudden, all these young fellows came in. My students, <laughs> they were as surprised as I was. So, so it was quite interesting. Are there any other uh, things you remember about that time period that you want to mention? Well, I remember that we had two basically different groups of cadets there, a group from New York City, another group from Boston. And they were very competitive. And, you know, they would kid each other back and forth, which is the better city, Boston mm -hmm. or New York City. So we had quite a rivalry there. So we, we had a lot of fun with them. And I used to spend a lot of time in the evenings. We used to go over there over, over the their facilities where they lived, uh, which is now Canisius High School, it was a consistory then. They were, they were housed there, they had their barracks there. And we used to go there and help them with their homework at night. It was rather interesting because they used to march every morning from the Delaware Avenue consistory down Delaware Avenue to Delavan, and they'd be marching to the school for classes. And of course, all the way down, down the street, they'd be singing. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a spectacle to see these uh, young fellows all pepped up on that school. So I recall many days going at the consistory there where we helped the students. Did you ever uh, main con maintain contact with any of them or run into any of them after the war? Well, one of them uh, married a local girl, uh, Paul, Paul Roger, Paul Vavakovich. He changed his name to Rogers when, when he got married. And uh, yeah, I, used, I saw him occasionally, but then he passed away a few oh. years uh, after the war, hmm. but uh, he married a local girl, so I did have some acquaintance with him then. Since you're a graduate of Canisius College and, and you taught there and were there now, what changes have you seen in the university and the college since you? Oh, I've seen a tremendous growth in the school and, and, a, and, and a fond affection for the school and seeing how it's progressed. I have great admiration for their ability now with that courses they have and the, the student body, they have done such a great job in developing a faculty where Canisius has really come along a way, particularly in their, their fields of business and uh, and even science now. Mm -hmm. Now after the war you, you furthered your education? Did you talk about that? After the war I, I joined DuPont where I worked finally for 44 years mm -hmm. and uh, during the course of my career at DuPont. I went to night school at UB and I got my master's and PhD at night school. I was the first student to do that at the university. Mm -hmm. So I got my PhD in chemistry then. So that's that's what I did. I worked for DuPont in research and I got to do environmental work. I got into uh, fitness work and uh, I got to be an industrial hygienist. I had to take a training program and then it passes their certification exam so I was the first certified hygienist in western New York mm -hmm. and I, that entailed my efforts to uh, pre look after the health of our workers. We tested the area for toxic materials, noise, radiation, uh, stress, mechanical stress and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So I got to be an industrial hygienist as well as a research chemist. How do you think um working during World War II in, in research and development, how, how do you think that had an effect on, on your career or your life? Uh, I, I guess it's, it's, it's just an inherent interest I had in research. I still have that same mm -hmm. interest. Now I do my research in genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still researching all the time. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that's my nature. And I, I started out that way and I maintained that, that same interest in looking into new things. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay. Go ahead.